Well, as you can all tell from the stuff on the screen, in this series we are going to be talking about medieval warfare. This is probably everybody's favorite subject on YouTube. I like it, you like it, so I figured why not. Uh, but in this series I want to do something a little different than what most of the other channels that cover this topic do, and that is go much more in-depth than... I guess what everyone else does, which is kind of like superficial. Most of the other channels talk about weapons, strategy, but military history, especially medieval military history and how it comes out of the late antique period, is significantly more than that. So to do this right, we have to talk about not only the technology, so weapons, armor, that stuff, and the various processes on how they're made, uh, but we have to talk about strategy, combat, logistics, especially logistics military organization, and military topography. So, how do you move troops around? If you are, I don't know, stationing for a night, where do you place your camp? Stuff like that. But before we get going with this, I have a couple caveats. This will probably be the longest running series I have on this channel. In a way, it's one of those things that will probably never ever be complete. I will probably never actually finish this because as, as you can see from the dates, 800 to 1453, so the start of the Carolingian period to the approximate end of the Hundred Years' War is roughly a thousand years. There's a lot of stuff we have to talk about, there's a lot of stuff we have to cover, and this is one of those fields where stuff is consistently, constantly changing. So on top of that, I'm going to try to make these videos short, or shortish. We'll see how that goes. Um, but just because of my own knowledge base, as well as a couple other things that I'm not going to mention here, but we'll get into in later videos, there is primarily, although not explicitly, but there will primarily be a focus on Western Europe. So specifically France, Germany, the Low Countries, and England, but also the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, those places. Now. When we talk about medieval warfare, there's a couple different ways we could approach this. And I thought a lot about it, and I decided to start, broadly speaking, with military technology. So in this video, we're going to be talking about that, and we're also going to be covering, in broad strokes, late antique military technology. So, with the medieval period, the, the basic thing you have to understand about warfare is that in this era, it's basically constant. If it's not a crusade or an actual long-term war, like the Hundred Years' War between England and France, it is some kind of private engagement between separate lords, maybe between villages. It's constant. And in order to wage warfare properly in this period, the technology is crucial to it. You can have the greatest logistics in the world, but if your troops are not armed with weapons and armor, they're not going to fight. But on the other hand, you could also say the opposite. You know, you, you can have the best weapons and armor in the world but without logistics. It means nothing. So there's multiple ways you could look at this. However, the key issue I want to bring up in this video is that in the modern day, we are very used to rapid technological advancement. So I am recording this on my MacBook. It is a 2013 MacBook Pro that I got in 2013, at this point in 2020, this computer is now outdated, but it's still useful. My point with bringing that up is that even after seven years, the technology in my device has advanced significantly, and I can technically, if I wanted to, replace it. You can't do that with medieval Europe. The rate of technological development and technological change is significantly slower. It's moves at a snail's pace in, in some eras and with some inventions. Yes, technically we have states in the medieval era. Technically there are large manor systems that have the capabilities to mass produce certain kinds of goods, but by and large the states in this period just cannot mobilize the resources like modern day states can, so the rate of technological change is significantly slower. So what that means for the study of weapons and armor is that, you know, 1300, 1330, 1340, 50, that era comes around and English armies start using the longbow. It appears to be superior to the crossbow. So, if we take that line of reasoning, well then, in the modern day, if we have a superior piece of military equipment, we would just replace everything with it 
and move forward to a more powerful, better equipped, more effective military. The medieval period didn't work like that. Just because something new came along, and just because something new was more effective, it did not necessarily mean a rapid replacement of older weapons or older technology with the newfangled thing. It's just not how that happened. So this is something we really have to keep in mind when we are studying the technology of medieval warfare. The rate of replacement is just significantly slower. Now, on top of that, for the study of the early medieval period, so approximately, and these dates are going to change depending on who you talk to, but approximately 400 to approximately 700. So in Western Europe, you know, largely the collapse, collapse, we're going to get into this, of the Western Roman Empire and the rise of the Frankish Empire, specifically under the Merovingians and then later the Carolingians, um, we don't really have a lot of sources. And we're going to get into why this is in later videos, but by and large, the sources that we do have are not overly concerned with, you know, all the stuff that we would actually be interested in in studying military technology. So weapons, armor, how they're used, how they're manufactured, those things don't really show up. Early medieval sources, which are generally speaking Christian sources, are much more concerned with the justifications, both intellectual and philosophical, for warfare. So when we study early medieval warfare, that's what we're dealing with. So we have to kind of read between the lines and use archaeology to potentially figure out what the equipment looked like. At the same time, we can kind of generalize in saying that the majority of the surviving equipment, not all of it, but the majority, is late Roman in manufacture, in style, in use. There are some barbarian... Barbarian? Uh you know, innovations and stylistic changes, but by and large, this stuff comes out of the late Roman Empire. So, spatha, you know, long swords, spears, mail, scale armor, spangenhelms up until about 700, although that date actually could potentially be changing, and, and we'll talk about that. But my point is that the early medieval military technology, by and large, comes out of the Roman Empire. People tend to use Roman or quasi-Roman equipment. Now, the common image with the barbarian invasions is that these guys brought their own stuff along, and to an extent, yeah, that's true. The Franks do bring things like the Francisca, the famous throwing axe, but the numbers of, you know, barbarians coming into the empire, and this is subject to change based on what literature we're working with and how we read the sources, but generally speaking, the percentage of population displacement that the barbarians cause in the Roman military and in the Roman state more generally is between 4 and 8%. So it's relatively small, doesn't even crack 10% of the overall population. So even if barbarians are bringing in unique styles of equipment, just due to the sheer numbers, Roman equipment is gradually going to just displace everything else. So this is basically what we're working with for the early medieval period. Now, when we talk about late Roman or late antique military equipment, we have to talk about the fabrici. So fabrici are state-run Roman military factories. Each one appears to have been specialized. There were some issues with this when we talk about mail, but by and large, each factory appears to be specialized in something. So one factory or maybe a handful make, I don't know, shields. Maybe a few others make long swords. Maybe a few others make bows, arrowheads. You see where I'm going with this. Uh, but these are also problematic because when we get barbarians moving into the empire and joining up in the military, very quickly we start to lose track of, well, what is specifically Roman, what is specifically non-Roman. Stuff tends to mix. And even going off of the archaeology in Central Europe, it, it's still vague as well, because much of the mail production in Central Europe, much of the weapons production in Central Europe is basically based off of late Roman stuff. So, and we're going to talk about this again in more detail in future videos, drawing a distinction in early medieval warfare in terms of equipment between Roman and barbarian becomes increasingly difficult as we move forward through time. So, because the early textual sources for medieval warfare in general are not great for the study of actual military history, 
for the early period, we have to rely increasingly on archaeology. And archaeology poses its own problems. So the weapons of the late Roman Empire, the late Roman army, like we just went over, between 400 and about 700 basically remain standard military equipment. And we have evidence of this stuff from archaeology, specifically weapons burials, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but also from epigraphy. Eventually, the weapon burials... So you're going to see different terms for this depending on what literature you read in what is today basically France and Western Germany, we have row burials. So that's one example of weapons burials. People are laid out in a row with all their stuff interred. By the 8th century, this stuff starts disappearing. So the archaeological remains start becoming more and more difficult to work with just because we have less of it. Now, because I brought up weapons burials, I want to just talk briefly about one thing here. One of the sources I went through to kind of put together the research for this video was Bacharach's Warfare in Medieval Europe 400 to 1453. And in it, what he basically says, as far as weapons burials go, is that it is clear that very large numbers of men were buried with swords, and relatively few of these men, okay, are likely to have been professional soldiers of barbarian origin. Okay, I completely agree with him there. My understanding of the evidence leads me to that same conclusion. But he loses me with the last part of the sentence much less members of an aristocratic warrior elite. So basically what he's trying to argue is that the people in these graves are kind of a mass group of warriors, not really an aristocratic warrior society. There are no, or at least appear to be no, warrior nobility. I have an issue with this, and we're going to talk about this more in future videos when we talk about the actual development of a warrior aristocracy. You know, the people we typically think of in medieval Europe as actually going to war. But... I just want to touch on this briefly here. In the late Roman Empire, the aristocrats, or the wealthy people, have a very specific idea, specifically the men. They have a very specific idea of what masculinity looks like, what it means to be a man. And that idea of masculinity is very, very closely tied up with this notion of otium and a classical education. So, classical education. Basically you are going to be expected to know Greek and Latin very well. Not vulgar Latin, not the kind of mixed garbled thing that the military speaks, because it's inflected with German, but a... I don't, I, I don't want to say pure, but a... Actually, no idea. A pure form of Latin. Very well spoken, very eloquent. You are expected to know Virgil, you're expected to know Homer and the Odyssey and everything else we think of when we typically imagine, you know, Greek and Roman classical literature. You're expected to know that. If something moves you emotionally, you are expected to sometimes quote from memory from those texts. You see where I'm going with this. The pursuit of otium is basically you're so wealthy uh, you don't work. The job of the aristocrat is to pursue scholarship and cultured leisure. You should dedicate your life to learning. That's what the Roman aristocrat understands to be masculine values. And it's very closely tied up with the notion that I am a Roman aristocrat and I live in the Roman Empire. Well, the Roman Empire goes away and everything is replaced by non-Romans, these Germanic and inner Asian peoples who have a different idea of masculinity. It's very tied up with war and fighting. So what we see around 400, 500, 600, especially in Gaul, is the shift. There's an intellectual shift among Roman aristocrats which lead them from thinking about masculine identity and masculine traits with education and associating it with war. So my point for this little tangent is to just bring up, you know, there are going to be differences in evidence. Bacharach reads these weapons burials in one way. I read them and other people will read them in a different way. So my point is a lot of the evidence is very contentious. Now, for the rest of this video, we're going to briefly, and I mean briefly, go over offensive and defensive equipment just as like a broad overview for the subject. And then we're going to get more in depth as we move forward through other videos. So in the post-Roman West, swords, axes, spears, by and large, tend to be the preferred offensive equipment. These are the preferred weapons. Swords appear to have been the most common. Elite burials certainly have very high-quality steel blades. Everyone else kind of has 
not crappy, but definitely less ornate, slightly poorer quality swords made of iron. There are also spears, there are also axes. Spears tend to be the main weapon of the infantry, very, very gradually as we reach the Carolingian era, so about 800 swords become the main weapon of cavalry. This is by and large across most of Western Europe and Central Europe, but not in Scandinavia. Swords come, but it is in the 800s and 900s. For much of the early medieval period, the main weapon in Scandinavia appears to have been spears. They're incredibly important, not only to culture in general warfare, but also in uh, Nordic mythology. The spear shows up all the time, and so are axes. These things show up in graves. Swords do not. The evidence for the defensive equipment in this period is, like so much else in this era, not great. Mail appears to be relatively prominent. There's scale as well. It's not entirely certain if the style of mail going into the early medieval period is patterned off of Roman manufacture or if it changes. It's not too clear. I've seen evidence for both, and we're going to talk about this in more detail in a couple videos specifically on mail. The helmets also appear to have been, or continue to appear to have been, rather, made in the Roman manner. The Spangen helm appears to have been one of the most common forms of helmet used. It shows up all over Anglo-Saxon sites, for example, uh, but by the 6th century it is probably the most common form of helmet. It drops off around 700-800 the origins of this thing are unclear. We're going to get into this in more detail on videos, again, specifically on the helmet, but there is maybe an idea that it comes from the steppe. Specifically the Huns, although I've also seen some Sarmatian ideas. Um, so, hopefully this has been a broad, useful overview for the first video, and we will keep going in the second one.